podcasting will will be a thrill. Grandpa and chill, grandson and friends. Grandpa and chill in full effect. We talk about it all, yeah, put it all on the set with that pet craze too. We chillin' with Rosie, come through, stay tuned, yeah, listen closely. Cause this the millennials in the silent generation coming together, discussion in rotation. This is Grandpa and Chill. Hey everybody, I'm Brandon Fox. You're on another week of Grandpa and Chill. I'm here with my amazing co-host, as always, Finest, our amazing producer, Sierra, and also Grandpa's here with us. So, and today we have our amazing guest, Jen Awindo. Am I saying that okay? That's correct. Awesome. Yeah. So, sorry, what were you saying, Grandpa? I forgot. I don't remember. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> <Very> present. <laughs> yeah. I think it was you, something you about mentioned... my mother having having uh, dementia. Oh, yeah. there you go. Yes. Yeah. I can recall I things, but it takes a little longer. As long as you can, then you're good. Well, I I watched this program Jeopardy. I don't know if you ever watch it, but I know a lot of the answers, but I can never pull it up in my head as quickly as the contestants do. I can never remember to say what is. Is that the one we answer with like what is something? In yeah, that's the hardest part I'm thinking to answer as I mean to have an, a question instead of the answer, right? Or the it's backwards for me. So Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. And I don't usually have the answer right either, but I'll still just blurt out something and not say what is and then say what is at the end. The wrong wrong answer. What is? <clears throat> Jen, where did you uh, get your training or how did you get your training? A lot of it, uh, most of it has been right there on the job, working, you know, in the industry for Mm -hmm. almost two decades. And then, of course, you don't even look that young. And I'm being serious about that. I mean, you don't look that old, I should say. All right. Well, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You really don't. It's for two decades. It's mean you've been working at it for 20 years. Yeah. Why don't we rotate or rewind Jen and actually have you tell our audience what you do and where, (laughs) what you actually study. (laughs) All right. Very good. Well, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Jen, uh, Jennifer Awenda. I am an assisted living facility manager, a dementia practitioner, um, a death doula, I'm an author, illustrator. I do a lot of different things. I volunteer for hospice companies, um, Banner Alzheimer's Institute, the Alzheimer's Association. I work with a lot of different industry professionals. Um, Almost two decades working in senior living and memory care. Um, not just memory care, but dementia care units. There, there definitely is a difference. Not everyone with dementia has memory issues at first, like with Alzheimer's. Um, but yeah, so um, it mostly stationed in the Phoenix, Arizona area. However, I've done regional roles in Nevada and Oregon and Texas. And so I've done a lot of traveling and I've written plenty of books about dementia and about senior care in general. So steps to take um, when you're looking for certain things or maybe some things you didn't know you should be looking for. I kind of give you some of the answers like that Jeopardy thing we were talking about. I kind of... um, point people in the right direction when they're sometimes at a loss uh, when it comes to senior care, senior living, and dementia and the dying process. And so, yeah, that's who I am, Jim. (laughs) I have a, a general question. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer, or is one part of the other? Yeah. And I'm glad you asked that question because um, dementia is expected to increase by over 200% within the next two decades. So everyone's going to have to really understand what the differences are. So Alzheimer's is a disease, um, just like Parkinson's is a disease. And there's a lot of different diseases that cause dementia. Um, But also a traumatic brain injury can cause dementia. 
um, chemical abuse like um, alcohol and drug abuse that can cause chemically induced dementia. Your severe stroke could cause vascular dementia. So Alzheimer's is just one of the many things that causes dementia. Dementia itself is the symptoms. It's just the symptoms. It's the cognitive decline, the behavior changes, the it's strictly the symptoms. So if someone says to me, uh, my mother has a diagnosis of dementia, I'm like, okay, what kind? Because if it's Parkinson's, maybe that person is very rigid. Maybe they had a lot of tremors. Maybe um, they're ha having hallucinations versus if they have vascular dementia, maybe they had a massive stroke and their paralysis is on a particular side. So dementia is just the symptoms of that cognitive decline versus all the different things like Alzheimer's that causes it. Um, How, I'm sorry, Brandon, go sorry. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you said 200% uh, increase. Is that just because people are living longer or um, environmental factors that are making things worse? Or All of those things are factoring into it. Um, yes, we're prolonging life, stretching it out as long as possible. So your chances increase over the age of 85. Uh, and there is a difference between normal aging and disease, right? So normal aging, I had a grandfather who passed away at 98 years old. He can remember every single thing he ate yesterday, what he did yesterday, last week. Even when you ask that question, um, it might not come to you right away, but it comes to you. And you remember someone asked you that question. You know, you're not mistaking a fork for a hairbrush, okay? So normal aging, you, you might lose your keys. Everyone loses their keys, but when you forget what keys are, or that's another story. You think that there's something to eat with, now that's a problem, right? The confusion, that's your dementia. It's going to increase by over 200% because of, yes, the heart disease and vascular disease that we are accumulating in our population. Um, that's one of the main killers, right, of our population. Um, in addition to, so it's not just lifestyle though, um, it also factors into genetic, um, some, it's, it's hereditary, right? So some of these diseases are hereditary. And if you couple that with a lifestyle that is not, um, conducive to fighting off disease, then, you know, we got a problem there. So, and then of course, too, we got to even think about the drugs on the street. There's a lot of homelessness now. Um, and a lot of those communities have all kinds of different things floating around there, right? And so that chemically induced dementia is going to play into it, not just necessarily the Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or, you know, vascular, right? There's going to be so many more things that are going to factor into why that's going to increase so high. Um, in addition to the fact that the baby boomers are now filtering in. So they call it the silver tsunami. The, I see them all coming into the assisted living now. The GI generation is passing away, you know, those World War II veterans. And now it's the Korean and the Vietnam veterans that are coming in, right? So um, we're seeing the baby boomers. They're living longer and they're coming in younger with a lot more diseases. So, oh yeah, 200%. And, but it's nationwide, um, not just here and also worldwide that that factor is um in the statistics so they're talking about on a worldwide basis because our lifestyle is also in other countries you got kfc and mcdonald's in, in south africa and in, in wherever else right so that's just all playing into it that's so sad yeah. um yeah what were you gonna say? yeah i got questions and comments this is all cool stuff and i and i am a little familiar with dimension all timers a little bit and i listened to something recently about it so that's pretty cool too um but I, the first question is how many kinds of dementia are there so like you were saying like someone's like oh my grandmother or someone has dementia <laughs> is there like you know is it gonna be like if i'm gonna be like oh this is my mom's or dad or whatever it has dementia or has these am i gonna be bogged down with a bunch of different versions of it or are there like one two three four no, there's, there's lots, there's oh, lots of different things. Oh, no. 
so many different things that did, I mean, probably close to a hundred mm-hmm. things. Uh, it was around that 80 mark, maybe five or before the pandemic, I heard there was about 80 th- different things that caused dementia and at post pandemic, I haven't gotten those. I haven't looked into it to see how many different things I was just like, it's off the charts. So it's, it's off the charts. Okay. All right. Um, I like the thing about confusion and not forgetfulness. That's pretty cool. Oh, okay. Um, before I go to my last one, though, I, I like what you're also saying with the homelessness and drug use and stuff like that. But I, I this is someone who doesn't know so much as much as you about dementia and Alzheimer's. But since we're social social creatures, and as we get older, we get like less social activity. I wonder. And also the homeless or people without homes also have a lot of isolation. I would wonder if that has something to play into lack of communication and socializing has something to do with dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, Oh, yes, I do believe that for sure, because I watch people go crazy slowly in their rooms all the time. They refuse to come out. They don't want to come out from, you know, to the dining room. They don't want to socialize with anyone other than the caregiver providing personal care. And I know that isolation is not good for them. But isn't it also a situation where other people don't want to socialize with them? Yes, well, especially when there's behaviors. Some people get really mean and not everyone is sweet and pleasant, right? <laughs> especially when you're in pain and you can't express what's going on. Um, your only outlet, I, I hate to say it this way, but as with children, when they're infants, let's say that they can't tell you that they're hot or they're hungry or they're agitated, right? They just gonna show you. Um, And you have to pick up those signs and that's exactly what it is with dementia. So people have behaviors when they can't express their needs, not everybody, but but a lot of people I've been working with over Mm -hmm. the years and their families hate to visit people. The caregivers are like, Oh gosh, we got to go take care of this person. And she's so mean. She hits, she punches, she does all these things. So yeah, it's, it's hard to be around some of those people. It really is. Yeah. Especially if you are the care, you are the spouse that's taking care of your loved one in the home. Oh my, then that that's a lot. That's a lot. It's different when you go, to an eight hour or a 12 hour shift and then you go home. So, but yeah, people going slowly going crazy in their rooms. That's kind of how it feels a lot of times. What what happens to the people that don't have anyone to take care of them? Like don't have family and are going through this kind of thing. Well, if they don't have family, then the state is going to have to appoint some type of a case manager, a legal guardian, someone who can make sure that if they have any money, you know, maybe a fiduciary, something, um, if they have a home, whatever, that someone is making sure that they are taken care of. And they're likely going to be in a facility setting if they have nobody and they're just in their home alone. And now the state has to get involved, right? They're not just going to be able to have dementia and be wandering off, not being able to get their groceries and waiting for a geriatric care manager to come and hopefully, you know, be able to help out. So if you have dementia and you don't have any family, then yeah, the state is, somebody's going to have to step in. Some people have friends that are their power of attorney. Um, I I have a Actually, I got a couple of residents. They have no children. So it is um, one of them has a group of friends that are taking care of her. And but that that also becomes a challenge, too, because sometimes they fight against each other and there there be some dramas there. So while you're young, appoint a power of attorney (laughs) to help you. And if you have property, make sure you have a trustee, put it in a trust because a will ain't going to prevent you from having to go through probate afterwards. Right. So there's a lot that plays into it. My, uh, my wife is a hairdresser and uh, she's been doing it for many, many years. And a lot of her uh, customers are quite aged. They're eighties, nineties, and even some in the hundreds. This morning, one called at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. She's supposed to uh, come in like on a 
uh, on a uh, Thursday or Friday, and she didn't know what day it was. She thought it was Thursday. Uh, you know, she's losing her mental uh, capacity and peers. You know, you don't know what, but I think my wife helps a lot of them, uh, not just doing their hair, but you know, being a companion to them. Mm. So uh, it's interesting to me that uh, that you're uh, dealing with people that lost their memory and don't, can't articulate, and you're probably, uh, as a guest, one of the most articulate uh, people that we've had on on this uh, podcast. <laughs> well, the residents teach me a lot. They teach me to slow down. I have a lot of energy. I'm just like, whoa, let's do this, right? I'm a go-getter, right? So they have taught me to speak slower when I'm around them, to speak very clearly and, you know, use a lot of hand gestures so they kind of follow along a little better. <laughs> but I don't always speak slowly, as you can tell. Usually I'm all fired up. <laughs> um, a person uh, that has some form of dementia that would ask the same question over and over and over, what, what, what is that all about? That sounds like Alzheimer's dementia, and that one is the most common form of dementia. Um, around 75%, you know, of all dementias are the Alzheimer's dementia. Um, sometimes it's mixed dementia, Alzheimer's, and some other things too. Um, but that Alzheimer's, it attacks the hippocampus that holds your memories. It takes your short-term memories and turns them into long-term memories. And when you start, you, when you're not able to take to take in those short-term memories anymore, you start remembering the past and and getting comfortable with repeating the same thing. So you're still part of the conversation. You're still trying to figure things out. You can say what you can say, right? Um, but yeah, that memory, but it, it does, with Alzheimer's, it does get to a point where they stop being able to find the right word to say. So, uh, the, uh, that, um, um, that thing, um, that thing that the, right. And so it, when, it, when you do have some words, you can still hold on to, there you go. And if there's some rhythm, the right side of the brain, the, um, right temporal lobe tends to keep the rhythm. So even if they can no longer speak, even if they can't remember things very well, if you start singing Jingle Bells or you start singing the Star Spangled Banner or something that they were, um, raised with, uh, from their earlier, maybe the twenties when they were 20 years old, put on something from high school, they'll start probably start jamming. Right. Cause that's, that's in their soul from when they were children, but, um, the newer stuff, it gets lost. So we do have to use those old memories, like old smells, the grandma's cookies kind of smells, right. The old, um, memories that they can tack on to instead of trying to get them to come into our reality. Well, that, you're, up, you're, you're upbeat. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, I forgot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Somebody else. <laughs> Save um, well, I just, I can imagine Jen, that it's, um, very fulfilling, but probably very draining and a very difficult field. So uh, why, I guess, where does the passion stem from for this specific field? Well, it started with my grandparents. So my dad is black, my mom is white. Okay, whatever that means in this country, um, it, there is a cultural difference. Um, my mother's family, my, my grandmother and my grandfather, um, they had two different types of dementia. They both ended up having to go into institutions. My paternal grandparents, my grandmother, she had vascular dementia, but she was taken care of at home. And then my paternal grandfather, he uh, had no dementia at all. He was sharp. It was just his physical body was breaking down, okay? But he was sharp as a tack. And um, they, he also was taken care of at home. So the getting into the industry was... When uh, basically, when I went to the skilled nursing facility to see my grandfather, that's really what pushed me a little over the edge. I was I was upset because 
I went for his, I it knew it was like going to be his last birthday. Okay. We could all see the time is coming. I'm not going to try and give him another pill and procedure. Right. So he was in the skilled nursing and I've got the cake with the Oreo cookies because he loves Oreo cookies, you know, things like that. Tried to make it special. Got my little kids with me. And this is going back almost 20 years ago. Okay. Um, but the CNAs that were in the skilled nursing facility, they were like, he can't, he don't know what you're talking about. He don't know what you, who you are. He, they were trying to give me that kind of an energy. And I was like, that's my grandpa. You've lost your mind, lady. You're more confused than he is. Okay. He yeah, knows. It wasn't like that. He, oh man. And, and you know, I, I get fired up. I, I try to control my emotions. I do. But anyways, <laughs> um, from there, that's when I started working in senior living. Of course, he passed away. Uh, my, my maternal grandmother had passed away. She had the Alzheimer's dementia. And yeah, that's kind of what got me into the industry. And from there, it was just trying to improve their lives, right? I, I came in as an activity director trying to get them engaged to doing all kinds of fun things. And then the, when the great grandkids would come to visit and they were playing over here in the corner and grandma's over here bored, come, come engage. Right. I started making the intergenerational programs and trying to get kids in to do the crafts and do the little cookie socials and anything, little dances, you know, just to get them involved with each other. And I started writing books about it for children, for children to have little five-year-old and 10 year olds, to have ideas with what to do when you come into a facility or you go into your grandmother's home and, or grandfather or whoever, and they've got advanced dementia, something you can do to where you're still, you're connecting. Those connections are so important. I'm glad you said that because it's the loss of connections that is dementia, right? Those are the, the symptoms, the loss of the connections. And when we disconnect from people, when we disconnect from the children, then, you know, we're perpetuating some negative energies in ourselves. How was that? So, um, yeah, that's what got me into it. Grandparents, um, being in their older years and, Ever since it's it's been my life, I kind of just threw my kids into it too. They had to volunteer. They were at all the Halloween and Easter bunny hunts and all of that. So, you know, singing the Christmas carols. Yeah. Well, this, this is perfect because I want to nerd out more about the social stuff. And I'm like, oh man, it has so much to do with social stuff. And I didn't want to talk over it because I'm like, you're the professional on it. But I totally think that um, that has so much to do with it. Like, Oh, like what you were saying earlier about, oh yeah, comparing, when we compare people with dementia with children, I mean, we're all human, like a children just like me, we both, I mean, they're, like we still, like, I don't know, like we still get frustrated when I can't, when you don't know how to articulate yourself, or you're upset when you don't know, like, it, it, it doesn't matter that the age to me, essentially, it's all that, that, that root thing, but I think a lot of, I don't know, like ageism in general comes from just not us not socializing enough with people of different ages, like, you know, and I definitely think that that's a connection with, with at least like from my gut, I don't know, but I think definitely has some of the connection with, with the decline of your brain. But I did also th heard something about dementia or the Alzheimer's being like diabetes part three or something. Did you hear about that? Or do you know anything about that? Well, they're trying to say that that heart disease, basically, um, heart disease is is coming in. That's how I take it. You know, that's kind of the vascular dementia is on a rampage right now because people are not taking care of themselves and we're eating, we're we're eating according to what we've been told is healthy or bacon and eggs for breakfast, right? But that ain't good for our body. It's 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 adding to disease, and science is showing that now. So. Um, yeah, the, the diabetes, the untreated, and, and you know what, it's, it's important to talk about a lot, a lot of things. <clears throat> you know, I do the YouTube videos too. I actually stopped though, um, right when my grandpa passed away, cause it was real hard when he passed. It was uh, right when the pandemic was coming in, but, um, and now I'm doing the videos again, but one of the videos I did, and I know this is hard for some 
people, especially fellas, to talk about is erectile dysfunction. The heart disease is plaguing our nation. We're, we're worried about COVID. <laughs> you worried about getting Alzheimer's? We should be more concerned about getting heart disease because that's what's taking most of us out right now. And it, I don't see it slowing down. The erectile dysfunction is your first sign that there's something wrong. So I know it's a real tough topic, but anybody's having those issues, they got blood circulation problems. That's the bottom line. So Alzheimer's is behind the the actually the dementia isn't hasn't even caught up to the heart disease yet i know at one point it will surpass it but our three main causes of death right now are that heart disease the cancer and the dementias that's what's taken us out so staving off the diseases is the only way we're going to prevent these things right yeah now when you were talking about the socialization those connections are very important. This time, a hundred years ago, we were being born in the home. We raised, we were together with multiple generations. We died in the home. We were not disconnected. People grew up on farms and they saw death all the time. They saw birth all the time. It wasn't a uh, taboo. Now it's taboo because you know, mid-century, 1900s, it started being in institutions. You're born in a hospital and you die in a hospital. And now we're at a point where people are scared of death. They're they're scared of all of these. They're scared. Gosh, you can't even say the wrong thing. So I'll probably be canceled for something I say, right? People are scared of so many different things. Um, but if we saw it more often, you get more desensitized. And I don't mean see it in the bang, bang movie, right? Or see it on the street, bang, bang. That's not a good way either, right? Those are kind of traumatic. But as a regular process in life, the, you know, the aging process and everything that lives eventually dies. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's where we're having some real problems. You know, the families, they're coming in and they just want mom to live. And mom is breaking down. Mom is tired. Mom can't do physical therapy again. And you're forcing her to walk laps around the community and her energy, her luminous cocoon is, is dying. It's, it's draining, right? And so I think that has a lot to do with the depression and with the reason why dementia has increased so much is because our people, they move away. You got married, you get your family, you get your job and you're gone. You don't talk to, oh, it's, oh, happy Mother's Day, you know, on the phone, right? And maybe you send some flowers or some chocolates for Christmas. And, you know, it's, we're so removed from our elders and it's, it's disheartening. It's really disheartening because we do have a nature. We are part of nature. When we are around children, the elders, they light up around children. The same way that when we bring in the pets, the pet therapy, the bunny rabbits and the puppy dogs, they connect with that nature. When I take them for a walk, even if they are they can't relate to what's going on in reality today, if you take them outside and start talking about the wonderful things outside, they relate to that. So that is what stays, that natural part of life stays, right? And we need those connections. We can't just hold up in one room, not talking to anyone, not getting any fresh air, it, you know, just doing crossword puzzles. Well, you were good at crossword puzzles. That's not growing your brain if you're good at it. You have to think, you know, go outside your comfort zone in order to keep growing, right? So I think those have a lot to play with it too. I was watching a program on TV, which seems unrelated to what we're talking about, but what was the program Nature, and they were showing that that uh, the the organisms or the animals of the sea need to have relationships with other creatures in order to survive, even like an octopus, a, a fish, a whale, whatever it is, even uh, coral. They they need to have relationships, and they they have various types of relationships with all the other animals of the sea in order to survive. So I guess yes. I guess it's important in throughout <laughs> nature, right? Yes. <laughs> Birds flock together, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well these were not even the same species. You could have you could have a yeah. a, a crab that uh, that hangs on to a different type of animal and they have 
they coexist together. Well, and even, you know, thousands of years, right? Um, people, they, they stayed in groups. Your chances of survival was better in a group, right? And I think it's the same way now. And being just because you're in the city doesn't mean you're in a group. You're not, <clears throat> if you're not getting any real, if you're just waiting for the mailman and you're watching TV, that's not going to help, you know, to create those connections. Mm -hmm. Jen, you said that um, you were talking about desensitization, and I'm sure that you've seen death a lot. Are, are you no longer afraid? Uh, and were you? And has that changed and stuff? And I've been a kind of a funny person, though, so I'm not afraid. It's um, <clears throat> to me, it's just going to sleep. We all go to sleep every single night. And, you know, when it's mm -hmm. your time, half the time people are not even in like they're on hospice in my community. You know, when they get to that point, we have them on hospice. They ha we have them on comfort meds. So they're not in pain. They kind of gently they gently go, you know, I mean, yeah, you hear the death rattle and you, you cleaning up the mucus and sometimes stuff off the mouth. And it's a natural phase though. You know, you, you gotta keep them cleaned and turned and things like that. So there's not problems, but they're usually on <laughs> meds, liquid morphine, and they're comfortable. So it's not a distressing it's not so distressing anymore because we've got hospice on board. Hospice, um, it now, hospice is, of course, across the nation, right? Uh, across the world, there's hospices. There are, are a handful of hospices in each state, but in Arizona, there's almost two, maybe a little over 200 hospices. We're talking 200 hospice companies. They're, the hospice is huge in this area. So, um, yeah, I deal with hospice all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. And they make life so much easier in our facility because they're coming in, they're helping with showers, they're helping with medication management. If this person, um, if there's something going wrong with this person and it's, you know, scary, then we're calling hospice. We're not calling 911. So this confused person doesn't have to go at the end of their life to the emergency room, you know, so they just make it very much easier for us in the assisted living facilities and dementia care facilities. But, but like, is this um, all sort of knowledge and uh, it, your thoughts on it are very peaceful, right? So is is it something that you've gained and learned through the work or you've just, oh, you said you're a funny person, like, I've always sort of had that mindset and stuff. Okay. I was raised in Oakland, California. And so, and this was in the 80s. And I saw things that happened out there, right? And it's, I kind of got desensitized to some degree, like this is just part of life and it's not a big deal for me. But let me just put it like that. Um, yes, it's it's hard to lose someone you love. When it's someone that's personal to you, it's a whole different, it's much harder than when it's a stranger on the street. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know what, even even last year, I was driving up, driving up Grand Avenue and a motorcyclist coming the opposite direction on the other side of the road got hit by a car and came flying into, the, not the motorcycle, the motorcycle was cut in half, but he came flying into the car and, um, and in front of the car in front of me. And immediately I'm, I'm reaching for what I need and I'm on the phone with 911 before I even had the car in park. And as I'm running up to him, I'm like, oh my gosh, did I look, lock my keys in the car? I'm thinking to myself, right? But it's just a uh, get in there and just, it's, you know, I mean, he was, I don't know if he made it or not, but yeah. we knew what we needed to, to do because when you do it a bunch of times or when you see it a lot, it's not, a, not as much of a big deal. Yeah, mm. that is uh, funny. Uh, it's still a big deal, okay? No, 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 We get it. You're, you a gangster. You didn't see it all. Oh, <laughs> just joking. But no, that's good. It's no, that's good. <laughs> um, it's still chaotic. No, it. it but no, it's controlled. This is great. No, this is this is all tying into me because I just finished this like, you know, this book about love and everything, and there's this whole ending chapter about like death and like our whole society being so fearful of death and. Okay. You know, that's what makes us so fearful to love. And once you're okay with like, hey, I'm ultimately going to die. It happens, yo. It's asleep. It makes you more open to be vulnerable and connect with people. Social, nice, love, you know, connection, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
Yeah, and I also think it's a very good um, technique to get people aware of heart disease by, especially the male perspective, by talking about ED, because, like, I, you know, you'd rather have your heart die than your dick not get up, you know, kind of thing. Like, at least from men, <laughs> at least from what I heard. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, good, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. And it's frank. It's right. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, it's you don't want to lose your quality of life just to stay alive. True. Right. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm watching people that are drooling on themselves. They can't figure out where they are. They're high anxiety. They're freaking out. They're crying. They're like, those are not my meds. And they're, they're like on one. Right. And what kind of quality of life is that? Yeah, we're having bingo at three o'clock. And yes, we have our singing coming up and our entertainer will come too. And we're making bacon cookies today. But what quality of life is that? So now for me, I wrote a book for the teenagers. It was called um, Once a Man, Twice a Child, Dementia Education for Teens. And that one, it doesn't just break down different um, what dementia is, what Alzheimer's is and stuff like that, Parkinson's and the symptoms, but it also talks about activities to do and, and hoarding and delusions and things like that, right? Um, and I made that because it, it's just, it, it's a full circle. It is a full circle. At the end of life, you need someone to take care of you. Even if you're not confused, you're still going to need someone to take care of you the same way as it was in the very beginning of life. You had a small home. It was your mom, your dad, maybe your siblings, and then you got older and expanded. Your world expanded. You started driving. You started traveling the world. You had your own family, and then it kind of shrinks back down, and it shrinks right back down to your intimate family and the caregivers that are around you. And so what kind of quality of life is it, though, if you are stuck in a where you feel like you're stuck, you feel like you're trapped? People are like, get me out of here. I want to go home. Things like in their anxiety and anxious, and all we can do is try another medication to try and balance them out a little bit, and hopefully they won't go be over the top every evening, right? It's it's real hard though to to try and find quality of life when you can't breathe, or you know your legs are all swollen, you know. So there's so many different symptoms at the end of life that steal your happiness away feeling comfortable in your own skin you must have a a, a great love for people uh, uh, to be able to deal with all of this and handle all of it uh, i'm very sensitive and uh, kind of like try to to uh, ignore things you know the, the the negatives in life but uh, you seem like a person who can handle it and you know you're outgoing and and pleasant and uh and obviously a, a real people person here a lot. Yeah, but it is hard. It's very hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. So all we can do is stay positive, right? And and be prepared. Learn as much as you can right now because with the stats as they are, that means it's not just likely that you will know someone with it, but it's it's quite possible that, you know, one of us on this program might have it in another 20 or 30 years, right? And so it's it's very scary. Yeah. Huh? What's the numbers, one to five? Oh, I'm not even sure what the numbers are like that, uh, one to five. In, 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 another, in another 20 years, would that increase 200%? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's going to be five out of like, five of us. Oh, probably. It's, it's bad. It's scary. Five of us. It's crazy. Yeah, I ain't trying to do no math. I'll, I'll, I'll okay. stick with working it's with right. people yeah, and do right. math. Yeah. We'll, we'll just assume that, we'll you, assume that you, everyone gets prepared. You basically get prepared. One, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'll just... No. You basically mentioned nutrition. So it sounds to me like diet is a big issue with, uh, with not developing dementia. The diet and probably exercise as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of course, that's what the doctor's been saying for a long time, too, right? But the problem is the physicians are not really taught nutrition in medical school. They might get, you know, 20 minutes or an hour out of the, all the years they're in school, right? So we've been trained to eat by commercials that say milk does its body good and what's for dinner, 
<laughs> right? Um, we've been trained that the food pyramid in, in the American Heart Association's website with reps, recipes is what we need to be going by, right? But the things on those websites are causing some of the diseases. And so it's like, what do you do? Okay, well, my husband actually, he's all whole foods. He doesn't eat anything from a can. He actually is, he pressure cooks his beans so it doesn't he doesn't have to soak them for six hours or whatever but he's all whole foods he doesn't eat any animal products nothing no milk no cheese no none of that stuff and that's harder for me it's easier for him because he was raised in kenya they ate kale all the time for us kale was a garnish it was at at the the, uh what is it the display <laughs> buffet <Yeah. laughs> it's just a garnish right and so it's harder for me to get into well actually i did i did the vegan thing for quite a few years but man that was hard so hard right um and and a lot of times the vegan stuff is all processed the veggie burgers and all these fake and bacons and and you know it's all processed food anyway so they're not necessarily good for our health either we're we're at a stuck point if even if you get some vegetables, if you didn't grow them yourself, you just hope they're organic, I guess, because we're not sure about what the GMOs are going to do. So what do you do? Right? All of us are kind of at a loss. But the overall is that if you eat whole foods and put the cheeseburger down, you'll be better off. I was just saying in a broadcast where uh, colon cancer is becoming much more prevalent in younger people today. just saw that tonight. Yeah. Mm. And there must be something in the food, I would think, you know, something in what's in, in their diet, what people are eating. Well, a lot of our foods are banned in other countries anyway. So, yeah, that in itself, I mean, gosh, the food coloring that we use is banned. Mm. E even to make the salmon pink, that's a that's a, a chemical that's banned in other countries that makes our farm salmon pink. But but are people in so, other countries living longer? Are they healthier? Well, I know their dementia rates are increasing too. So there you have it, right? Every it's going up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked so much shit about the food pyramid on this uh, on this show in the past. Um, yeah, and it's really hard. I hear you. I went vegetarian like a year ago, um, and I try. I really wanted to not. For health reasons more so for animal stuff and i gained like 20 pounds very quickly and i was just like the least healthy i'd been you know so it's like it's very hard to find the uh the balance and stuff like that mm -hmm. um, but, yeah. yeah um i wanted to ask you about like uh your actual you said your your community you're building so uh, is it all solely older people with dementia or are there people without dementia that are there just like older individuals or what, what is your actual building or, or um, place that you own or work and stuff? The facility that I manage is owned by two registered nurses and it's, it's a locked facility, so you have to have the secret code to get in, right? Mm. Because we can't have anyone wander out. There are a few people who don't have dementia there who can have a conversation with you about what was on the news just yesterday and who's running for presidency, right? Mm. But for the most part, everyone else has dementia. So, or a severe enough cognitive impairment that if they went and saw the neurologist today, they would have a de dementia diagnosis. But a lot of people don't get the diagnosis. Or a PCP, a primary care physician, will say, yeah, this person has dementia, but then it won't hold up like in court, right? It won't hold up unless it's a neurologist. You know, that sounds That's so weird. familiar. And I guess it's silly for me not to know the difference, or but. I, I just, in the last job I worked was working with people with disabilities um, and usually cognitive, but all types of disabilities, but cognitive was the, the main one. And your setup sounds very similar. Um, do, you, do you, yeah, I don't know. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my career has primarily been in the larger facilities. 
Um, I at one point managed a 150 bed, five story assisted living and memory care facility. And the memory care was on the second floor. That was weird wow. because how do you get the residents out for sunshine when they're in the second floor? Yeah. So yeah. and what about fire? Yeah. What about and, and, fire and, exits and stuff? I bet fire. Um, what's the thing called when you have to do uh, those drills? Where well, it must have been a pain. Oh yeah, my fire god. Drills, evacuation drills. Oh. Well, the scariest thing was when a resident who had dementia, who had, must have been some type of uh, he was he was good with his hands and and and. Anyways, he was able to unscrew the window. He got out the window onto the ledge of the second floor. And he was saying, I'm going to jump. I'm getting the heck out of here. I'm getting out of here. And we had to call the police and all that stuff and coax them to get back in. And then, of course, from there, I was like, you're going to behavioral health. You're not staying here. So he had to go to a behavioral health hospital. Uh, well, they went, they took him to the emergency room first. Um, and then from there, he could not come back. So... Yeah, there's there's some interesting things. Actually, the book that I am about to publish, it's about my experiences in working in assisted living facilities. And I have also interviewed over a dozen people. I actually started out with about 40 people, but I narrowed it down to right around a dozen people. I've weaved in their stories working in the industry as well. And this book is being published this month, um, mid-month on Amazon. It's called Cold Hearts, Warm Bodies, The Secrets Inside Assisted Living. And I called it that because I, I'm I'm we're we're real we're really we're struggling out here. Guys, we're like drowning. We're drowning in this silver tsunami. And it's it's getting real scary. Okay, so it's not just about um communities where memory care is on the second floor. It's about uh, we're dealing with people who don't want to work. And when you don't have people to work in healthcare and things start falling apart, it's one thing to, you know, drop a shirt at a retail store, but if you drop a, a frail resident, then you got some broken bones. And I talk about this kind of stuff that I have experienced in the industry. I'm also uh, releasing a bunch of YouTube little 30 second animations because some of the stories are just over the top. Just wow, really? And they're some of them are really funny. <laughs> this book is going to be very funny and disturbing. So the cover of it is very disturbing. It's actually a picture of that I got at six o'clock in the morning from one of my caregivers who was upset at the night shift for having left our resident covered in feces on the floor on a blue mat um, all night long. And you could tell it was for hours because the feces were dry. It's not like this was fresh, right? Mm -hmm. And she had them, she had dementia. She's got it all over her hands and her face. And cause you know, they're like children again, they're, they're playing and stuff, you know? So she, um, she, they took a picture of this, you know, poor lady and sent it to me. And I was the brand new executive director. I had started there only two weeks prior and I was just, I was, I was, <laughs> actually i was i was vexed like this place is a nice place how are you gonna allow this to you know just you sleeping on the job that's basically what it was the caregivers were sleeping in the recliner chairs on the job and i know that because i checked the cameras and that's exactly what they were doing so i took screenshots of it so i could prove it to unemployment when i fired them and then they say well we want some unemployment right so anyways um that is what the cover is it's literally of this lady laying on the floor and it's um of course it's a professionally designed cover it's not the picture of her because that would have been a violation of her her privacy but i hired an animator um and book cover designer who said he could do anything my imagination comes up with i was like well you're hired <laughs> so he's doing the anim animations for me and he also did the cover of the book but yeah, so cold hearts, warm bodies, the secrets inside assisted living. And I call it cold hearts and warm bodies because that's what we're hiring right now. We're just hiring warm bodies. And these people that ain't got no hearts, they don't give a crap. They will let people lay in their filth and be t playing on their cell phone. Hide, you know what I mean? And, and things are happening. You got some people that are working double shifts, trying to pick up for the ones who were not pulling their weight and they're burning out 
And so it's it makes it harder, right? People are not carrying their weight, right? So that's what no, the no. book is about. Yeah. In a nutshell. This is uh so I'm sorry, Grandpa, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna ask, uh obviously you're on the right side of this issue, but couldn't this create legal consequences for the facility uh, exposing this so, issue? This isn't for one particular facility. This is my experience over the past 20 years in multiple locations and other people's experiences as well. No names are mentioned in the book. Nobody wants to be actually the only the only person I interviewed that said, I don't care if you say my name. It's because you retired two years ago. It's like, I don't care what they're going to do to me now. Right. But everyone else is like, don't, don't say it. Don't say it. So, um, I have to keep them anonymous. There are no names. It's more of a general overview of what we're going to do. This stuff is happening. Medicare, they're, they're taking it away. Social security, that's going away. You know, people, they want to live on disability and they want to live on welfare. I had, I had a caregiver actually ask me to reduce her hourly rate. She, I had just hired her. And she came to me and she said, you know what? I need you to reduce my hourly rate so I do it doesn't affect my welfare. And in the past, I've heard people say I need less hours. But now they, they're they asking me to take hourly pay away from them so they can still have their food stamps. And I'm like, we're supposed to use that for a hand to get out of the gutter, not to continue living in the gutter on a handout, right? So... Mm -hmm. It's taking away able-bodied workers. And I'm looking at this um, across the nation. Some states are like, well, we need to have a minimum $1,000 a month for every citizen or we need to pay whatever. And I'm like, oh, great. There's the rest of the workers. We already don't have caregivers. And now you're going to pay people to sit home for even longer? Yeah. You know, people are getting their tax returns right now. We can't find any caregivers. They don't want to work because they got their little bit of money. Ooh, so it's a real is, struggle this, out there to find this is great. Wow. care residents. I'm so sorry I'm nerding off because I oh man because I was I've been I'm I was CNA or a nurse assistant or healthcare provider for from for about got eight nine years of experience and I left for burnout or burnout just really honestly just exactly what you're saying not even burnout so much because I can love for quite a long time or whatever um, but it's just like paying for rent having relationships outside of work. Just trying to work on my own things. Just allow, like, it just was just less taxing to do other jobs. Um, but I did definitely, definitely. I'm, I can tell you stories too about like the people from the night shift. There are the other shift where it's just like, man, it's just, yeah. it's just un, un, ungodly how people don't even think about other people as other people. But, anyways, um, digressing past that though, I, I do like. I, I think people, again, I'm just very sympathetic to everybody. So even the person that just left me on that shift that treated this person so cruelly, so bad, like they would never treat themselves that way or their mother or anybody else. Um, the reason why I'm just a tiny bit sympathetic for them is that this job is such, you, we just talked about it. You just talked about how deep and how much you have to give and how much you have to have in your, um, your hands to do these jobs, not like folding a shirt, you're taking care of a body, it just, it's not only deflating to a person not getting paid enough, but societal looking at you as someone that's lesser than when your job is extremely important. We all will end up being a, a child twice and an adult once. Um, so that, I just, I don't know. I just think there should be some more, I don't know what the answer is, but like definitely some more value. There should, I shouldn't be playing a personal trainer, double the amount that I'm getting you know, working my hourly job, taking care of people. I'll tell you that much. I, I don't know uh, what's going on there, but there's clearly an issue here. Um, but yeah, I feel you. I feel you. I feel your frustration because I, I definitely be sitting there at the, the water and cooler with my, my coworkers talking about like, man, these people are lazy trying to cut hours. I'm working a double shift. This sounds so familiar. I'm like, I can't believe I'm working 16 hours. Why this lazy person ain't doing nothing but sleeping. Um, yeah. I, or a no, no, no show. Maybe. They just don't show up. They don't call. They just ghost you. It's, it's, and you're waiting. Everybody's waiting on this person so they can go home. Oh. You know, so so this other person can go home. They done worked all these hours. They're ready to go home. And then the other person just don't show up. 
Call me, and that's a lot. Call it's me a foolish. lot now. Call me foolish, but I, I think that there can be a middle ground where this person can be lazy as hell. Not lazy. They're not even lazy. They are lazy. But they're just opportunistic. They're taking advantage. They, they don't get paid this much. They don't care about something they don't get paid for. It's almost human nature for them to cut even more corners. There should be a setup to make them not make that decision. It should be easier for them to make the better decision. I don't know. I know that sounds very silly of me and very like sympathetic to the other side. Um, but I, I, I did patient advocacy and I talked to CNAs and stuff like that. And I kind of hear their point of view and it is not appropriate, but I do hear what they're saying, which is they hungry too. Um, yeah. Interesting. Interesting stuff. Well, very late. I thought it was a money thing. I really did think it was a money thing, but cause you know, before the pandemic, they were making like $14 an hour. Mm-hmm. 13. I remember um, in 2021, I got to a community and there were still caregivers making $13 an hour. And I was like, wow, okay. And that's in Arizona, right? I know in um, Nevada, it's the same way in Oregon, the same way. Well, I raised all the caregivers rates. So um, to $20 an hour, Oh wow! if you're willing to pass meds, you're at $20 an hour. And so I was like, okay, everyone's going to $20 an hour. We gave cash bonuses for Christmas. And I'm talking 250 bucks, not just, you know, a $25 gift card, right? We, we, we do all these things. We stock the break room, free lunches. You don't, um, you don't clock out for lunch. It's paid lunch and we cook for you as well. So if this is your only meal of the day, you got plenty of food, you know, so we do all these things, right? But guess what? They still don't want to work. They still call off all the time. It ain't just the money. It's it's either the lazy or the I'm burnt out. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. We got a lot of that stuff going on. People are, are burning out. They're burning out bad, especially post-pandemic. Because the staffing crisis was way before the pandemic. Caregiving, we couldn't find caregivers. I remember being up in Oregon trying to hire, do job fairs, all of that stuff, and nobody would come. We would hire someone, they'd work for two, three days, and then they'd vanish. So there's been a lot of that for years, decades. But now it's even worse. We will get 40, 50 applicants, and only a few of them show up to the interview. If they do show up, they don't show up to their first day that kind of thing, or they'll work two days and then they'll vanish. And it's like, come on, what are we, how, how do we get out of this? So I have to call up the caregiver registry companies, you know, all the nurse on demand companies, they're short staffed too. They don't have the caregivers. Then I'm like, what are people doing to make enough money to eat i mean the rent went up exponentially in the state of in the city of phoenix area how are you they making it you know mm-hmm. but that's what we're dealing with not enough people to take care of our elders and the baby boomers are filtering in we've got one lady in her earl or on her late 60s and she's just falling apart oh my gosh she's coded twice We've had to do the CPR on her twice and the the son doesn't want her to be on hospice. And I'm like, too bad. She's got to go on hospice if she's going to be in my facility because she's going to die. And we, mm-hmm. I can't, I don't want no one dying in my facility if they're not on hospice. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, it's tricky to what, try and get the families mean? to understand. What, what, what does that I'm mean sorry? if they're not on what does it mean they're not on hospice? What is so if they're not on if someone dies in my facility now I've got to report that to Department of Health Services because we've got a death that is that needs to be investigated. If they're on hospice, they were already towards the end of their life. Now they're getting Medicare benefits through hospice, so it's like a and we're ready for that. Yeah, it's just mortuary. Okay. We call hospice. They someone so died. You call hospice. They they come. They remove the body. They're the ones that call the family. Um, they call the mortuary, they, they bring three hours later, they're being gurneyed out, you know, so we don't have to deal with any extra drama around it. Mm -hmm. And the families are in denial thinking that their loved ones are going to live so much longer. And I'm like, no, honey, this person is like, she's in her last days, not just her last years. A lot of people think they have years and Most of the time, by the time they're looking for assisted living, they've got months because they're waiting until the last minute. 
They've already fallen repeatedly, got UTIs, going back and forth into the hospital, back to the rehab, going back home, and then it happens all over again until it's just a broken cycle, a mm. broken record, and then they finally end up in a facility when they've potentially now they've got you know, staged pressure, pressure ulcers or, or some other issues, you know, that may take them out, right? They're already on hospice by the time they get to us a lot of times. So, um, but when they're not on hospice, it's harder to convince the families to understand this person is, you know, towards the end of their life. So the age for the facility I, um, managing right now is late sixties, all the way through late. Actually, we got two people that are a hundred now. Two people just, they're 100 years old now. Wow. You're in a tough business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah what, what are your thoughts on everything, Grandpa, as a senior? Oh, sorry, Ben. No, 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 please. I didn't hear you, Brandon, but I think you addressed it just, to me. What, what are your thoughts on everything as the uh, resident senior citizen of the podcast? Well, I know in the situation with my mother, she had uh, dementia, probably Alzheimer, and she wanted to stay at home. In fact, I took her to a beautiful assisted living place, and we had dinner with some of the staff, and she was fine. And when they brought her up to, to the room, she carried on so much, they said, you better take her home because you'll end up in, in the ER. Um, and uh, I was fortunate that I had a very good caregiver uh, until she passed away, and several other caregivers. She had around the, around the uh, clock care. But she actually became, I think, less difficult as a person when she had Alzheimer than she was before she had it. And uh, without going into the whole explanation of things. But, um, you know, I, I, I can see where, you know, there's all people have all different personalities. Uh, I was watching a program on TV, I forget what the name, they call them the Karen or something like that, where these people are absolutely unreasonable and they may not be old and may not have dementia, but they become very difficult with store clerks and restaurant people. And I'm sure that some people with uh, dementia uh, are similar to those personalities. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what were you going to say? I don't know that I answered your question, Brandon, but um, uh, I, I find this a very interesting, um, a very interesting interview that we're having this uh, again on the program. Very interesting. Part yeah, of it's kind of personality. Yeah, very upbeat. Yeah, it's always nice to be able to nerd out with somebody that's been in that has worked in the industry. You know, because it's hard to complain about stuff. Or, you know, I think people that work in healthcare have such they do have a morbid sense of humor because they see so much. So it's always I, I sometimes am like, uh, like I'm working a job in an office now, and people think my sense of humor is very dark and morbid. Actually, I was I was joking about death the other day. I was like, I never have to pay a bill again. It's gonna be great. Um, and they were like, Oh, it's so bad. And, uh, it's whatever. Um, but don't gotta wake up to the alarm clock. Don't gotta worry about any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Um, well, I guess what I have right here in my notes right now. I get. I know you've been writing the book for twenty years essentially, but when did you really start writing it? And what's your YouTube? So I actually, I started writing at the age of nine. I have written over 20 books. And this particular book that I'm about to publish this month on Amazon, it um, I've been like seriously writing it since 2017. Okay, wow. Yeah. And I'm sorry, what was the other part to your question? What's your YouTube channel? It's Jen Awinda. So, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, when I said I'm a funny person, I wasn't joking. I am, I think it's because I'm a Gemini too. I am a Rasta woman. I've lived in the light of Rastafari since I was in early teens. Mm -hmm. And I also go by the name Empress Ivory. Mm. So my books that I write about black history, about Rastafari, about environmental conservation, all of that stuff is under Empress Ivory. And that's under my rootsyouths.com website. <laughs> but my senior living, all my um, dementia training and stuff like that, those kinds of books, those ones are under jenniferawinda.com. 
So because I work in the industry, right? And people know me, hey, Jennifer, I'm managing a community, right? And I'm like, well, go to jenniferawinda.com and you got some trainings on, you know, the, the occipital lobe and what it's about and the amygdala and the hippocampus. And at least you can get versed in the dementia thing, right? Um, so jenniferawinda.com when it comes to senior living and care. But when it's the African history and, you know, my, my culture living in the light of Rastafari and other topics, that's rootsyouths.com. And those are all the children's books. Those are strictly children's books. Jennifer, before you got online with us, um, I'd asked uh, Finus and and, uh, Sierra uh, if they had any comments about Black History Month. And I didn't, don't recall what they told me, but um, do you have any comments about something that maybe we should try to learn about black history? I know that's way off the subject of what we've been talking about, but. Well, you know, um, actually, I just was able to go to D.C. about four months ago, and I went to the Museum of African American History. And, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that's against having a month because, I mean, come on, really, there's not White History Month. There's not you know, all these other kind of history months, right? And black, the black experience in the United States is the United States history, right? It is our history as a nation, whether people want to admit that or not, Native American people who were here, that they, that's, that's American history too, you know, even, you know, be, even if it was before it was called the United States, I even think if that's it was four or five I think that's exactly ago. what Fina said. Isn't that what you said? Exactly the you same thing. I thought you were, I could have sworn you weren't going to remember it. I was like, he ain't going to remember I said that. I remember. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what he said. No <laughs> dementia for you. You remembered. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when it comes to American history, you know, I wrote a book and it's called Made in the USA in Black and White. And it's got the illustrations. It's a it's a children. It's a book for more of the teenagers and young adults. Okay, because I'm sorry, old people, their minds are closed. They ain't trying to hear it. It's just what it is. You know, they a lot of older people are stuck in their ways, and there's no trying to break that. But young people are more open to you know, understanding and learning and sympathizing and seeing different sides of the story, right? Not just his story, but our story. And so this book that I wrote, I did about three, four, maybe four or five years ago. I don't even remember how many years ago now. It's made in the USA in black and white. And I literally took both of the experiences, the um, America, the great and American Nightmare. And I put the different perspectives in that book side by side. Oh, yes, the inventions and look, we are in a nation and all these wonderful things. But from the other side's experience, it wasn't so sweet, right? And it, it compares both of those sides of the story. And it's a timeline. It goes through several hundred years of history. And we're talking a 25-page book. It's not like it's a big thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's designed for teenagers. So, yeah, that one, that's what I have to say about the Black um, experience and Black history in our country. Have you ever uh, considered going to work in the government? <laughs> You know what? Um, I I considered working for the state to be a state surveyor of assisted living facilities, but not to get caught up in all the madness of um, this has been systematic. There ain't no fixing a uh, the car was broken when it rolled out of the factory, right? And so that car. It ain't gonna get any. It don't matter how how many rims you put on that sucker, right? So, I think it's a broken car, and it's not gonna come out of it. It started with oppression, and it'll always be that. I just have that feeling. Is that is that cynical? <gasps> yes, almost. Oh, oops. I'm, I ain't trying to pretend like everything's all roses. We have elected the same people for thousands and thousands of years. It's the same politicians in office. So, no, not to work in the government like that. I don't want to be one of them. 
<laughs> I know we're getting close on time. I just, uh, on that, uh, merge with what you said before about the silver tsunami and everything is falling at the seams. Like, uh, not that you would have just like a solution off of hand, but is it, is everything just going to collapse in 20 years? Like what are we headed towards? Like a great, you know, um, if there's all of these facilities and not enough caretakers and then, uh, everything's going to explode in dementia, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? It, it looks very grim. It does. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. It looks really, really scary from where I'm standing. And really? I question my sanity a lot working in this industry. My mental health definitely suffers. It's, it's a really hard um, profession that I've chosen to be in. And it's because we don't have reliable people that actually care. And you know what? I'm going to say it like this, too. This is what also scares me. It's not just certain generations because I got people that are 60 years old coming in and they're applying for jobs. They work two days and then they quit. I literally had homegirl text me, where's my final paycheck? And I'm like, really? You came for two days now and we are obligated to pay you fine. Fill out the paperwork. Well, I don't want it like that. I don't want to fill out the paperwork. Well, then you ain't going to be paid. You know what I'm saying? It's like, really? And this woman is like 60 something years old and she has to work. She can't retire because she can't afford not to. She should be retiring. But our country, it, they, our country is, is scary. Our children have mental health problems. We're all stuck in these devices and we're like walking around like zombies. We're not paying attention. And this is who we have to hire. And I deal with families that are upset because we don't have adequate staffing because even the staff we do have that show up, a lot of them are totally indifferent and separated and they just don't care. And, and you know, the families are paying six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month for some of these, wow. you know, facilities, right? But what can I do? I can't clone myself and I can't fill every single shift. I mean, literally on Super Bowl Sunday, on Saturday, I filled the shift from six o'clock in the morning until Sunday afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon. I was there for over 24 hours because of caregivers calling off. Ooh. And this is who we have to rely on. And I'm like, how much can I take before I crash? Really? So it. It's very difficult and there's a lot of people that are getting out of the industry and they're trying other things because they're burning out. So it's scary. What does the future hold? Um, you know what? Medical aid and assistance and dying, okay? Because no one is going to want to be subjected to the cold hearts that I have worked with. Scary. Yeah, and, and, I'm scared. Who knows if, if we'll still have any kind of a democracy in time with the way things are going. Yeah. So I, I can't even give, I, I, st I try to stay positive as much as possible. I smile and I bite my tongue and just, I, I push through, I push through just like the rest of us. We're just trying to push through. But all of us are like teetering on this balance, like how much more can we take? And that is really scary knowing that people are coming in younger. It's not just the 60 and 70 and 80 year olds. We got 40 and 50 and 60 year olds filtering into assisted living facilities. Wow. And no one wants to work. And the skilled nursing facilities are going through the same thing and the hospitals as well. So it's, it's really scary. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I have enjoyed this interview with you more than i believe any other podcast that we've done i say that sincerely i think that uh, you're probably one of the most articulate persons who we who's been on our show i really believe that that's high praise from grandpa because we've done like 80 something and he's always like oh man can i leave now <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah usually you usually i'm falling asleep <laughs> yeah no, no, i shouldn't say that <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll, just, he'll, just, he'll just get up and close the door. <laughs> we'll, we'll still be rolling. Um, amazing. Uh, we always do last thoughts on the show. So, uh, Grandpa, what's your last well, thought? Just, just what I said. I've, I've really seriously uh, enjoyed uh, listening to you. You're just uh, smart as a whip. You really are just right and very interesting. 
Awesome. Finest. Thank you. Finest. Um, lots of things. I appreciate you bringing the doom and gloom into the place. Um, first of all, because um, I think that we need to know, like, again, I, that's what I like about this podcast is like giving people a, a, a platform to, to speak on this stuff and to be like, hey, I'm I'm in it. I'm in this. I'm in it. And it's bad right now. And anytime someone can hear some of that light and get out, pull their, self, pull their head out their own ass a little bit to hear someone else's thing going on. I think it does. I think it, I mean, some, hopefully someone listening to this or at least me, I, I'm taking a whole different route of it. Like, you know, just seeing that you're working really hard and I was one of the people that left the the, the uh, medical field because of burnout. So I, I uh, give it to you and I appreciate it. And it's, it's duly noted, you know, like I'm, I'm taking it in and I, it, it resonates with me. So I'm, sh- hope, I'm sure it resonates with other people. So thank you for all the work you're doing. We appreciate it. Awesome. I'm not sure. If Sierra's there, but um, if Sierra is, any last thoughts? I'm here. Hey. I've been listening. <laughs> um, yeah, very another very dark, very informative <laughs> episode of the show. Um, but you know, like Fina said, it is always nice to have like a passionate expert in their field come on the show and talk about it because i tell if if you've listened to the show if you give it a listen you'll know that almost every day i come every week i come on here and i say you know we live in hell everything sucks (laughs) i hate it here (laughs) i'm immigrating as soon as possible (laughs) um and you just hit a lot of my core points so i really i really appreciate having you (laughs) having you on jen thank you so much for coming Awesome. Uh, Thank my you last, for uh, yeah. Um, I, I was just curious. Like, uh, it's almost like a like a chef writing a book. That's like stay like never never go to a restaurant kind of thing, right? W- would you recommend that I keep uh, loved ones out of a facility like this, or just be really uh, cautious? With, you know what I mean. So that's a very large question to answer because for some people like like one person i'm thinking of he actually wrote the the, um the synopsis for the back of the book his wife i know him because his wife had alzheimer's dementia and then it became mixed dementias but he moved her into the memory care facility when she started getting physically violent at home he could no longer take care of her The facility he moved her into was a good facility. The executive director, he actually, some of his stories are in the book. I interviewed him, 35-year veteran executive director. And he he had the place running very well. Of course, we were still short with caregivers, but we made it work, okay? So she was in a better place, and it was actually a good place. She was taken care of 24 hours a day, and when she got to the point where she was, you know, total care, he knew that she was, you know, well cared for. So he, um, again, wrote the synapses to the back of the book, Cold Hearts, Warm Bodies, The Secrets Inside Assisted Living. Now, not everyone is going to be able to afford assisted living, or maybe if they don't have money, they can go on to Medicaid, not Medicare. Medicare does not pay for assisted living, but Medicaid does. And it's called something different in every single state. Um, that's, That's when it would be scarier because the Medicaid buildings Oh my gosh, there's a lot more negative things going on in those because like right now I'm getting about $220 per day private pay. We do not accept Medicaid in our building. It's strictly a private pay building. You had to have long-term care insurance or a whole lot of money to be able to afford that or veterans aid or nice pension, something, right? Medicaid there might they might be getting re- reimbursed a hundred, hundred and twenty, maybe even a hundred and fifty dollars a day. Probably not, not a hundred and fifty, most likely. And so there's not really a lot of money to put back into those buildings. A lot of the Medicaid buildings that I know of had bugs, thugs, and drugs, and that's almost what I named the book. When you say day, you're talking about twenty four hour period. 
when you use the word 24 hour period mm -hmm. so um around 200 dollars per day is what senior living costs in the state of arizona um, and if you have dementia, then it could be more like that $220 per day, or, you know, it's getting, it's getting even more expensive than that. So yeah, it's, it's a lot. Not everybody can afford it. Um, not everyone can afford a good place. And then with, even with good places, you never know when there's going to be a change of ownership or a change of management and somebody can come in and they absolutely crazy and they trying to run a show or corporate doesn't allow, um, you know, the executive director to do what is needed to make the facility run well. There's just so many different dynamics with saying, yes, you should go in or no, you shouldn't. Where do I it's sign up? For <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll fill it out for you, Grandpa. No worries. Um, but definitely check out the book because I write all about this. Cold Hearts, Warm Bodies, The Secrets Inside Assisted Living. It, it'll it be on Amazon um, March, March 17th. A lucky is, day. What is the last thought, Jen, that you want to impart on the audience? And then uh, if you could restate wait, all wait, of wait, your wait, 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 wait. Brandon, you got to give, you, you give a thought. You gave her a question. You ain't get no thought. <laughs> oh, my thought is uh, uh, I'll uh, I'll sign Grandpa up. No, um, I don't. I don't know. Dude. I'm I'm just uh, this is this is helping me spiral downward. <laughs> so, but uh, you have been one of the uh, coolest and best guests, and really passionate and informative. And I'm very uh, happy and grateful that you've been on the show. So I really appreciate that. So. Um, Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Your last thought. Learn as much about dementia as you can while you're young and get private long-term care insurance because we're all going to get old and have to pay for some type of care. Awesome. And then and stop now. being so afraid of hospice. Just because you're going on hospice doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means we're going to have extra help now. Cool. All right. Um, where can people find you and all the links and stuff like that? Um, I am, of course, you can go to my website and that's where you can find a lot of the YouTube videos, a lot of my books and things. Um, I do a lot of senior care planning and end of life care planning, stuff like that as a doula. Um, jenniferawinda.com, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-A-W-I-N-D-A.com. And I'm on Facebook but not really a lot. I'm trying to get more into social media, but I'm so busy that I, I love to write, but sometimes my writing consists of speaking into my phone while I'm driving to work because it's hard to find the time to just sit down and do some of these things that I love. So yeah, jenniferawinda.com. You can definitely see, um, you know, my books and things like that on there. Um, and I know I'm on Instagram, but I, I'm not, I think it's, I don't, I think it's jenniferawinda. <laughs> jenniferawinda probably. Yeah. However, uh, no, no time like, for that. Yeah. yeah, we're, we're <laughs> even, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty bad with socials myself. So mm -hmm. no worries. Um, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Jen. Thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, yeah thank you. Grandpa's gone. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't lying. Grandpa mm. just dipped out. Whoa. Yeah, Very cool. getting there. Nice. All right, bye, y'all. Yeah. Podcasting with Grandpa Bart and Rosie Always on his shoulder This is Grandpa and Chill Grandpa and Chill is brought to you by your hosts, Brandon Fox, Bart Frank, and Finus Jackson. Our producer is Sierra Doss. To watch and listen to full episodes of the show and follow us on social media, visit grandpaandchill.com. That's grandpaandchill.com.